cheeky back heel. With ease, Miguel Aziz, his first goal for Portsmouth. Into the path of Smith Rowe, into the box, Smith Rowe scores! A really deserved first goal in Huddersfield Town Colours. Happy New Year, everyone. It is 2024. This is the fourth year of Hail End Productions being in service. It is a huge year for us on the content side of things. The team is going to be growing this year. We're going to be covering more and more and more often, everything more in 2024. It's going to be a huge one. But away from Hail End, we'll continue to bring you everything you need to know about Arsenal's Academy, more specifically, how our loan players are doing with their temporary clubs and a little bit about the players at home a profile here and there maybe a breakdown of a certain position maybe a guest hoping to get a lot more guests in 2024 i know i have said that in the past but we actually have some things set up that are going to be exciting and potentially potentially this summer one or two former hail enders who I have reached out to and spoken with potentially about coming onto the podcast, but nonetheless, let's start 2024 hot with Charlie Patino, because this is a subject that is not just strictly covered on away from Hale End or strictly covered by Arsenal accounts, but Charlie Patino is a bit of a hot topic in the sport at the moment. He is not in the team at Swansea right now. He's not making any starts. He made zero starts over the festive period, logging only 119 minutes in those four matches. And many people are speculating that it's not that Charlie has fallen out of favor with the interim manager. It's not that Arsenal are recalling him to play him and don't want him to get injured before the January transfer window opens. It is that many believe Arsenal are recalling him and selling him to Juventus. Now, I'm going to tell you from what I know about Charlie Patino, what I know about Arsenal and how they view Charlie Patino, and what I know about Italian sources when it comes to transfer rumors. I think that's very unlikely. The only sources I've seen say anything about this are the Italian journalists. And Italian journalists are often, let's not say they are ploys of Italian clubs, but they're often given incentive to you know, create rumors uh, to help push transfers through. And I would be very surprised if a player like Charlie Patino would go to Juventus in the middle of the season, especially when he seemingly was on his way out the door this past summer, then decided and was convinced to believe for another year in the Arsenal project to go out on loan for another year and then be integrated into the team, or at the very least go out on loan another year and see if he can impress enough to be integrated into the team. So I don't believe Juventus is in Charlie Patino's near future this January. I don't believe he's fallen out of favor with the manager either. I think Swansea are in a bit of a weird situation. Yet again, Charlie Patino finds himself here where managers change over. It's a different play style. Every manager likes different players. Having said that, Charlie did play really well in the match this past weekend after he was subbed on 10 minutes in due to injury on the pitch, which likely opens the door for Charlie Patino to get some more minutes. He played in a fantastic ball early in the second half that led to Swansea's best chance up to that point in the match coming in off the right half space, receiving the ball, taking his time, very patient, playing a beautiful ball to the back post where his attacker actually took it quite well but was unable to finish. And then he did really well a few minutes later in the match. Later in that second half in tight space, he rolled away from contact, took a touch, created another chance, swinging the ball to the other side of the pitch, which was unfortunate not to go in. But more importantly, as we said at the top, what really is next for Charlie Bettino? What what does the future hold for Charlie Bettino? He's 20 years old, so he's very young. I feel like because he made his senior first senior appearance over two year, around two years ago, people expected him already to be an integral part of the first team. He's only 20 years old, playing for a team that, you know, I think a lot of people underestimate the fact that Arsenal found themselves in a title race last year, which was about a year or two earlier into the project than they expected. And going into this year, you know, it's considered a poor season if we don't win the title or at least are in a similar title race and also competing at the Champions League. Is that really the time to put a 19-year-old right into the team, directly into the team? Probably not. So that is why Charlie was convinced to stay another year. He made 37 appearances for Blackpool last season. He's made 20 appearances already for Swansea this season. 
And obviously, he has those two appearances for Arsenal's first team. During that time, he has seven goals and eight assists in senior football, which is a fairly decent return here for a young center midfielder who's played only 60 appearances at the senior level, and many of those, if not at least half of those, are not starts. We've seen Charlie Patino not only play for five different managers, not including Mikel Arteta. We've seen Charlie play in every phase of midfield. For Blackpool last season, he started as a left-sided eight. Then he was playing in a double pivot. I mean, remember, the manager changed so many times. Then he was playing as a lone six for much of the year. And then again, back into a double pivot on the left side. He has been involved in build-up as a left-sided midfielder or a right-sided midfielder. He's been a lone six Deep line playmaker. He has been the highest pressing midfielder of the bunch. He's been an attacking, he's been a creative midfielder, finding pockets of space in the midfield to receive the ball in the half turn and push forward. All of these different roles to me sounds a lot like the career of Granit Xhaka before he really started to excel under Mikel Arteta, right? Think about it. When Granit Xhaka was in the Bundesliga, he played a lot in a double pivot. He never played as really as a lone six until Arsene Wenger bought him and kind of tried to convert him into that role. We didn't see him have a lot of success at that, but again, you learn a lot of different traits playing in different roles, something Arsene Wenger was the best at getting out of people. I mean, during his time at Arsenal, Grand Chaka then continued to play all of those different roles I just mentioned about Charlie Bettino, maybe aside from being an attacking midfielder. But again, the key with Charlie Bettino was he was an upgrade on Granit Xhaka into the fact that a future upgrade, I should say, of Granit Xhaka into the fact that he has that final third bit that we missed so much in this role last year. I think the thing that Kai Havertz has been so great at in that role is, is adding that final third, adding goals and assists, adding late runs into the box from that left-sided eight position. However, he has taken away some of the deeper build-up aspects that we need from that role. And, and a lot of the reason why some of our chance creation and, and our middle access has gone down. The good news is Charlie Patino strives in build-up. He has an incredible passing range. He has the ability to work out of tight spaces with ball manipulation and draw fouls. He was in the top percentile of midfielders who drew fouls last year at Blackpool, a team that did not have that much possession of the ball, yet here's Charlie Patino continuously doing something every time he got on the ball, whether it was creating or at least earning possession for his team. And of course, Charlie Patino has those great long strides, that little bit of burst. It's not speed, it's not pace, it's just a burst with that first touch that allows him to kind of gallop past defenders and then make that dangerous ball. His passing range obviously is not in any way biased towards one side. He has excellent ability to switch play along and give players the opportunity to run onto a ball in space. And this season, his chance creation has gone through the roof playing in a much more advanced role, utilizing both sides of the pitch, not being strictly forced to play as a left-sided eight or a right-sided eight, but really you know, using his high IQ and ball playing ability to enter areas and zones where he can pick up the ball and have a second on the ball before he has to play a pass. Think about the amount of time he has and the amount of space he's had in a lot of the goals that he has created. And then of course, as we mentioned at Blackpool, his defensive work ethic was just incredible. He it did limit the rest of his game, but it showed that he's a two-way force in midfield and a dual winner, exactly what Mikel Arteta expects in this role. And the genius of Charlie Bettino is all of this versatility, which allows him to play different roles even throughout a specific match, depending on game state. If we're pressed high up the pitch and need help, you know, add an extra man into the buildup, Charlie Bettino can do that. He can operate in those spaces. If we're, you know, chasing a game and you need an extra midfielder playing much further ahead of the six or playing ahead of the chance creators and in a place where he can make late runs into the box, we've seen Charlie Patino do that. If you need a player who's great off of a dead ball, Charlie Patino has been as good as anyone in the championship this season on corner kicks and in those types of angles from the sides of the pitch. And might I say, that's an area where I actually think Arsenal struggle a lot. Not corner kicks, obviously, but some of our other set-piece routines. The delivery is rarely one that makes you feel confident in the players who are taking it. Even the likes of Martin Odegaard have struggled in those positions. So Charlie Patino, what I think is most likely is he stays at Swansea. Swansea figure out who their next manager is. Maybe it is the interim manager. Maybe it's not. But Charlie Bettino finishes the year as we had planned, and he continues to get more opportunity. I don't believe he's going to be riding the bench for Swansea the rest of this year. And we have a few more weeks. You know, if in the rest of January, he's continuing to be in this position, maybe he is recalled. Maybe instead of going out and spending money on a midfielder this January, Charlie Bettino comes home and gets his opportunity. I don't think it's likely. 
I do think he could play a role, but I don't think it's likely. I think you have Emile Smith Rowe, who is still not getting enough time in midfield. Obviously, different profiles, but a similar, let's call it position, for lack of a better term. And then Charlie, when he finishes the year at Swansea, then we make a judgment. I think he is integrated back into the team. I think he's a profile that we're really, really missing. Whereas I think last year, a lot of the times in those games where people expected us to be attacking more, it was like, okay, let's play Fabio Vieira at left center mid instead of Granit Xhaka. Let's let's play further up the pitch. And we can have that opportunity now with a Kai Havertz at left center midfielder, but in game where we need to control game state or dictate possession a little bit better or have two players who are deep line playmakers are players who can make progressive, you know, line breaking passes like Declan Rice. Charlie Patino can play alongside Declan Rice. I think the fact that they both can play as a left sided eight or as a lone six, that's a huge advantage. I think that's an idea that we've tried to kind of see with Thomas Partey and Declan Rice in the same team. Yes, there's this idea of positions. Oh, well, Thomas Partey, when he did it, is playing as an inverted right back. Charlie Patino is not going to play as an inverted left back. Okay, but you can still occupy spaces with different positions, right? You can have Charlie Patino as a left-sided eight, occupying that second role next to Declan Rice, who's playing as a lone six, but he'll play more as a right-handed side in the buildup of that 3-2-5. And then you just have an overlapping right back. Let's call it a Brook Norton Cuffey or a Ben White or a Takahiro Tomiyasu or any other right back we bring in or a Jury and Timber. And the left back could be a Jakob Kivior or any of the left backs that we've been linked with or a Lino Sousa, whatever it might be. There are ways for these roles to work and for specific players to occupy the spaces where they can be at their best. And Charlie Patino can occupy so many different spaces so well. Charlie Patino could play as a right center midfielder in the way Martin Odegaard has been as of late, where he's playing a little bit deeper, a little bit further away from Bukayo Saka, so Saka isn't you know, forced into such tight zones and, and so restricted. And Charlie Patino could play that right side center midfielder position who's helping with build up with Declan Rice. And you could have Martin Odegaard as a left center mid. There are a lot of different things. I think a Patino Rice, Emil Smith Rowe midfield would be brilliant. Nonetheless, Charlie Patino should likely fill out, finish out this season at Swansea, but I do believe that he will get the chance at Arsenal next year. As I just mentioned, Brook Norton Cuffey is really coming on strong right now. He is in a fantastic run of form, the best run of form he has had in the senior level in his career. And it's kind of all of the things that I've been saying he can do, and I feel validated for it. And not that this is about me, this is about Brook Norton Cuffey. But if you've been watching this for a while, I think a lot of people have gotten frustrated with how optimistic I am about Brook Norton Cuffey. And it's not just because I want to see him succeed. It's because I know he has these qualities inside him that if he can activate consistently to go along with the things that he literally can't be taught because he has them already, the speed, the strength, the pace, the IQ, the very high attacking IQ for a defender. These things, like he's finally putting them all together match after match after match. And because of that, trying other things that are working, that are coming off strong, that are, are putting him in more dangerous positions, it, it's a joy to watch. And, it, it, and it's brought Millwall a great run of form. That's three wins in, four, in a row for them, four wins in five, and five matches unbeaten. Brooke had an assist in the 1-0 win over Norwich with just an incredible, incredible effort and ball from him. He ran all the way from the deep inside of his own box to make himself an option in the final third. In just nine seconds, he got from his own six yard box to the edge of the other box in a full sprint to latch on to a pass and swing in a low hearted cross right into the path of the striker who tapped it in for the finish. These are the types of things I'm talking about. We saw this from Brooke all the time at the youth level where, you know what? Maybe he wasn't involved in play, but he saw an opportunity to use that ability that nobody believed he could get up into that position. A defender isn't covering there because they don't see him as a threat. And then he shows up and makes a ball perfectly across for his striker to finish. He could have had another assist just minutes later with a beautiful little looping ball that kind of landed on a head, but then ended up falling to the back post where a Millwall player was unable to capitalize, but the keeper did make a great save, should have and really could have been another assist. And he just really enjoyed his freedom throughout this entire Norwich match. He popped up into the box in the second half with a free header on goal. Unfortunately, he kind of scuffed it, didn't really get all of it, trying to head it into the ground. But we'd love to see Brooke taking those chances, and that just shows the confidence that he has with himself in that final third right now. He got forward well in the Bristol City match as well with a headed attempt on net, winning an aerial duel, but just again not getting enough power behind that header 
And he's really just overall making faster and better decisions in the attacking third. He's making smart, incisive passes into the run of attackers, putting them in scoring positions. And it's making defenders draw more and more players over to him, allowing him to open up those lanes where he can play those balls. I think before and a lot of last season with Rotherham and Coventry, Rick Norton Coffey actually found himself in so much space that at times he was indecisive. He was either not picking up, picking out a player and just throwing it across or taking too many touches and then the chance had gone. Right now he's seeing the pitch beautifully. He's seeing defenders draw towards him. And before they get to him, he's finding that pass. And oftentimes he's really picking out a player with a low hard ball, which again, I keep saying, if you remember this, if you remember that, that has been his thing. That was his thing at the academy where low hard balls from early crossing opportunities into the run of the path of the striker right outside the six yard box. And he's doing that excellently. Arthur Akronquo is back into the side. He's made a great return to the side. Two clean sheets in a row against Newport County and Swindon Town. He's wearing a mask uh, to protect that jaw. Two saves apiece in each of these matches. He had a great save just 25 minutes into his return. Getting big, he closed down his near post and made the save on a pretty well struck shot. And he hit the ball hard enough to stop an easy rebound. Just two minutes later, Arthur made another incredible reaction save off of a flash header at the near post off of a great cross. He got his hands to it just enough to push it off the post and out of play. Again, not just making the save, but preventing easy rebounds. These are the types of things that make a goalkeeper potentially elite. Not just a good shot stopper, but kind of almost a game manager in the same light. And then he made a smart save late up, late in the match, up 1-0 against Swindon Town. On the 94th, he stayed on his feet after a few deflections, got in front of the shot, and covered it up. He has done this a couple times. He did this later in the week as well when they played against Walsall. He actually made five saves in this match, even though they gave up three goals. Nothing he could do about the first. It was just a well-worked move, ending in a goal. Then gave up a goal from a free kick. I will say it did feel like he was a little bit too far towards the opposite post. Like, really gave the entire goal up. It was a well-taken goal, but... This is the one thing we've seen with Aconquo, those longer shots, he's not always in the best position. But the ridiculous slave off of a deflection, as I mentioned, was really something else. It seems to be something he kind of strives at where he's able to stay, not rooted to his spot, but stay on his feet for a half a little beat longer than expected. And then not have to dive or guess or, or be caught out by these deflections. Uh, and he wasn't fooled here and, and made a great save. And then the third goal that he he gave up in this match was a three-on-one. Again, Akonko couldn't really do much. He actually did well to get his hand to an attempted chipped shot, but there were two other players and no defenders around, and that put the ball into the net. But he did just give up one goal in the final match over this festive period against Barrow. Uh, nothing he could have done about the goal, but made a simple save later in that half on a long shot, which, as we said, has been his weakness. And it was hit quite hard. He was able to catch it. Uh, after, you know, kind of knocking it down, not giving up a rebounded goal as well. Tyrese John Jules. I'm excited to talk about Tyrese John Jules because as much as he's had some decent spells at a lot of his loans where it's like, okay, he's gotten some goals. Okay, he's finally healthy. Uh, he's kind of looking to gain some form. It feels like, you know, if this time if he could stay healthy, if this time he could stay healthy, I truly mean it. If this time... He could stay healthy. Tyrese John Jules is not a League One player. He is way too good. He has just been so excellent around the edges of the box, creating something, just using his patience, his vision, his ball manipulation. He's only really feeding off of substituted minutes at the moment. It was 56 minutes across three matches during this festive period, which is really not a lot, but there was a lot to like from this. As I mentioned, just like getting the ball around the edge of the box, getting his head up, taking a couple touches, kind of shifting the defender off their spot just enough to then create a shot or create a cross. It's not just finding other options with those touches, but he's getting on good chances onto net. And those are the kind of chances that even if they're from tight angles, they're low and hard where a keeper just gets a hand to it and it turns into a goal. He's got a way of kind of manipulating the ball, changing the pace of his touch to create these chances where the defender actually doesn't know when it's coming and neither does the goalkeeper. And when the vision is blocked and you're kind of, off the beat per se, like in think about it in music, instead of hitting it on the snare, you're kind of hitting it on the off beat. It can really take a defender and a goalkeeper by surprise. And his movement is so special as well. He really knows how to make a run either behind the def shoulder of the defenders to the ball a little bit, or just enough to turn one defender's head and allow his attacker in behind him. 
And the confidence is just growing every match. I mean, as I said, this just simply is not a League One player. Watch on this play the touch, the reception, the hit movement, the ball manipulation, and then the absurd ball striking to top it off. And all of that in the two or so touches. Just an incredible player. He He's such a special number nine. He, he really always has been. And it's great to see him getting the opportunity as a super sub with Derby County. And, and my Derby County fan friend is just so excited by him. And I, I hope he gets the chance not only to stay healthy, but to, to play 90-minute matches. I mean, these are just little moments he's getting in 12, 18, 21, 9, 26 minutes of action at a time. Imagine growing into a game. Imagine using all these different skills. And so a defender's at a point where they have to just guess on what's coming next. And that's when a guy like Tyrese John Jules can really take advantage and score goals and create goals. Speaking of number nines who can score goals and create goals, Mika Beerith has been as good as anyone I've watched from Hale End on loan in a very long time. He is a nailed on starter and Motherwell's best player, bar none. I, I think it goes without saying every single good action that I see that comes from Motherwell, whether it's a goal or assist that Mika's contributed, a hockey assist, or just simply a good piece of transition play comes from something Mika Beerith has done. His work in the box to get in front of the ball, keep his man on his back, and create chances for players around him is incredible. He played a crucial role in the opener against Livingston, taking advantage of a loose touch by the defender, getting the ball into a dangerous position in the box on that very first touch, which then turned into a goal off of the next pass. Again, he made the important touch to create a Motherwell goal just a few minutes later into this match with a beautiful heel flick on his first touch yet again, starting the odd man break, which then turned into an easy goal. And then the assist came against Livingston as well from Mika's excellent interception and then first time pass into space. Again, starting transition for a team that struggles to possess, a team that struggles to advance the ball through midfield. It's just just brilliant. It, it really allows this team to stay in matches and score goals at a pretty incredible pace for one that creates very few chances and doesn't have much time on the ball. And in this Livingston match, I mean, Mika could have had two or three more assists. Later on, he made a great run off the back shoulder of the defender, cut it back with his weak foot to the attacker in the box, who just didn't get a shot away and decided to pass it up, but an opportunity that Mika created yet again. And then in the match with Hibernian, he does a great job of changing up his runs. Sometimes he comes towards the ball so he can take advantage over the top into the channels later on in the match. And that's not often where his goals come from. This is somewhat of selfless work that he does. It creates space for his team who struggle to play out, and it allows players to have that outlet pass over the top where Mika might get onto the end of it, where these defenders have to start playing a little bit further back up the pitch to allow his midfield to have more time on the ball. These are the types of selfless things that a great striker can do. His first assist in the Hibernian match was great. He took an incredible touch and played a nice little ball around the corner, which isn't even the right phrase, but the way it looks is like when a number nine receives the ball with his back to goal and plays the ball around the corner to an attacker running onto him. And it, this is kind of what happened here played the ball right into the attacker's run, and he had an easy finish. And then his second assist in the Hibernian match, Mika won a header on the back post, back post, back towards goal, where his teammate finished the goal, gave Motherwell the lead, and just shows how good someone like Mika, who he's not the tallest, he's not the fastest, he's not the strongest, but he uses his frame and athleticism so well for a player like his own. And now that's six goals and five assists in the league for Mika Biareth. And I don't know. The more I watch him, the more I think, heck, if we sell Eddie and Kedia this January or this summer, let's say we bring in an OC man or a Bonafacce or an Ivan Tony in the summer, and Jesus is one of our other striking attacking options, why can't Mika Beareth be another? Honestly, why can't he? He seems to have so many of these skills and just such a good creator at a time when we could use a creator. In other exciting news, Alex Kirk returned to the Bromley side after months out for three straight matches. Unbeaten in those matches, Drew against Altrin Cham, maybe. I like when you guys comment and tell me what I pronounce wrong, whether it's names or towns, because I'm, I'm not going to even go much further, but I'm not the best at it, especially with some of these English towns that I've never heard of. But let's just say Alex Herc played and they drew Altrin Cham. Altrin Cham? That's one of those sounds right. And they won against Ebb's Fleet twice. And Alex Kirk scored in the most recent of those matches. He did really well to just kind of turn and shoot on the half volley and just spanked it as hard as he could kind of near post and it got past the keeper. 
Great goal for Alex Kirk. Great to see him back on the pitch. He's a solid center back. He is a league center back, not a non-league center back. He's better than Bromley level, and I expect to see him, you know, League One next year, maybe finds himself onto a team that can make a little run into the championship, and who knows? Alex Kirk's a solid player, someone who can get a job done, and I think he's got a real future in league football. Uh, Keto Taylor Hart continues to not be involved for Bromley. Omar Rekik is recovering from injury still. And it's not clear if this Wigan loan move is going to be extended. They're rumored with another young center back who might come in on loan, uh, which would mean Wigan don't have room for him on loan at the club. He can only have six players on loan. So we'll see. They have until January 20th. I think it depends how the injury recovery is going. But nonetheless, I think the injury is not too long, so Arsenal will probably look for another loan. Salah Edinu Ladam Han seemingly still out with injury. Can't find anything about him anywhere. There's nothing to read about him. So I'm just going to guess it's long-term injury that he's gotten very unlucky again. Nathan Butler, Oyede, he played 33 minutes in four matches over the festive period. Just a disaster of a loan. Just, just over 200 league minutes in 10 matches so far this year. Feel bad for Nathan. I mean, he really was in his best run of form in the first half of last season. And since he went out on loan for the second half of last year, now the first half of this year, it's all been awful. Uh, I really felt like he was going to turn that special run of form into something, and he just hasn't been able to do that quite yet. Catalan Sirjan and Rapid Bucharest are on winter break. Mauro Bandiera has not been in the squad since December 9, after he did return from a six-week absence on November 28th. I don't know if it's injury-related. Again, can't find anything that it is. Feels like with new management that has come in and their struggles at Colchester, that he could be uh, someone who's recalled and sent out somewhere else. Seen some rumors uh, for him to a couple of different clubs in League One and League Two. So we'll see what happens with Bandiera. Henry Jeffcott uh, and Derby Under-21 have not played in quite a few weeks. Their schedule is just shocking to me. Uh, and then Billy Vigar, still very involved for Eastbourne Borough, who are in a brutal, brutal relegation battle in the National League South. That is our loan roundup. We did a little mini profile type thing on Charlie Patino at the top. Let me know if you want to hear uh, more of those types of, like, breakdowns of how a lone player's future might look, what it might look like for them next year. Let me know if there are certain profiles you guys want me to be doing uh, coming up. I think, you know, we've done a lot of the big names, some of the names who have been kind of around the first team. Obviously, we're going to have a bunch more loans coming up soon as well. But I really want to do these profiles on people you guys are interested in. Uh, I, I enjoy doing the research and, and kind of breaking them down. I enjoyed talking to Charlie Patino today. He is a big, big name people are talking about right now and one I haven't given up on. So, that's away from Hale End. Happy New Year again to all. We will continue to be doing this weekly. I know you guys are enjoying the YouTube uh, version of this, so please like, comment, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and make sure you've checked out Yanks Abroad. Subscribe to that channel. I will link it at the bottom. Me and Casey are ripping it over there. Uh, we got our Euros prediction coming out around the same time as this video. Way too early Euros prediction, might I add. And then we also have a little transfer special coming out next week. And a lot more fun things to come over there with Casey at Yanks Abroad. Again, I will have that linked below. Subscribe here. Subscribe there. Find me on Twitter at Hailend Productions. Find me on TikTok at Hailend Productions. I do a lot of fun stuff over there as well. And otherwise, peace.